Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Brendan Playford, I'm the CEO of Constellation Labs. This is my co-founder and CTO, Wyatt. Um, we're going to kind of switch up the pace a bit this morning and give you some sort of lightweight business kind of overview of what we're doing, and then we're going to dive in some pretty heavy technical stuff. Should kind of make it a little bit more interesting. We're going to take you basically down the rabbit hole. Um, before we want to go any further, what is Constellation? We are the unbounded blockchain. Um, can people just put their hands up? Who here runs a full Ethereum node? We've got a couple. Who has a mobile phone on them? Come on, this should be unanimous. Don't leave me hanging. Um, right, so uh, <laughs> what does that mean? If everyone could imagine for one second that every single phone in this room was connected, every single phone on your person had a small lightweight node that contributed in some respects bandwidth and resources to our network for an incentivized reward. Um, that is what creates this idea of a horizontally scalable and unbounded blockchain, uh, which is what we are building. Um, I'm going to go on to our next slide and go over what this actually means. So we're using uh, a new type of technology called a DAG, Directed Acyclic Graph, um, that actually has this checkpoint block system uh, in its sort of architecture. Uh, and really what that means is we're this thing that we're coining as a block graph which has lightweight, mobile-compatible nodes that creates this distributed global mesh net of devices. And what our vision is, is there's roughly 5 billion people on the planet, sorry, no, 5 billion mobile phone connections and 7 billion actual mobile devices. When you aggregate all of that together, using our protocol, you could theoretically achieve 30 billion transactions per second, with each of these devices contributing resources, throughput to the network. On top of that, you layer in an incentivized elastic compute computational layer, rather like SETI at home, but tokenized. And this comes in these three pillars that we built. We've got a partition consensus architecture, which Wyatt will talk about, Hilo chain, a reputation-based delegate selection model, which we call proof of meme, based on memetic behavior and a formally verified framework that uses category theory, ignore the scale down there, that's a hanger that shouldn't be there, to provide a similar standard like the ERC-20 standard to chain complexes and fibered interconnected chains. We see a world where there are going to be multiple chains built on a standard that interacts and have liquidity between one another. Our vision is to have fearless transactions for micropayments, Income for anyone who owns a, moan, uh, a phone or a mobile device. Enterprise-ready, elastic computing that you can do machine learning and big data on. And a diverse ecosystem of interconnected blockchains, which we call chain complexes. So I'm going to hand over to Wyatt, and he's going to talk to you guys more about the technical side of how we achieve this. All right, well, uh, right down the rabbit hole, guys. All right, so I named this talk uh, Thermoeconomics, which is its own field in itself. Uh, a lot of people in the economic space have been applying, um, I don't know, concepts in physical systems in order to describe uh, the interactions that we use for, for commerce. Essentially, um, you can treat an economy like you treat a dissipative system or like an engine in a car. If it's inefficient, you lose energy due to heat. We did the exact same thing. Um, so, uh, I'm going to uh, break down three main components I want to talk about today. Um, one, I want to talk about how we model distributed systems today in industry. Uh, two, I want to talk about how we use that to actually create an unbounded blockchain. And then three, I want to talk about how we can extend that to actually create uh, a structured internet of blockchains, something that might have something akin to an ERC-20 token standard. Um, so. Number one, there is no industry standard for modeling and differentiating blockchains. The best thing that we have right now is just to reuse what we use in industry uh, in the distributed system space. And not only does that give us like a, a succinct vernacular to actually describe and explain these concepts, but it allows us to natively integrate with all of the backends that, that make up the consumer applications you use on a daily basis. 
Um, we rebuilt the concept of a blockchain from the ground up to actually be as resilient and usable as something like Uber or Google. Um, so to break this down, uh, essentially, uh, all these different models use an application of algebraic topology, uh, so some pretty far out there math, but uh, we use something called homotopy type theory or the notion of like inheritance or uh, you know, some type of a type hierarchy. Uh, this is something for you developers use probably every day. Um, and essentially, it allows us to define scalability as just an optimization problem. So we use this, uh, these different techniques all the time, or at least major industry players do. Uh, Google, obviously, with MapReduce and Pregel, uh, GraphQL, uh, which is this microservice API, and then quite literally the internet itself. Um, they are applying algebraic topology or methods from that field to implement graph computation. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, oh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so why does this actually matter? Um, so everything that you've been probably heard from that panel earlier today on AI, um, we need to uh, you know, use more sophisticated uh, you know, models like neural networks in order to solve problems uh, that we typically describe as something that lives in a topological uh, space or like we deal with dealing with topological data or data that's in a super uh, high dimensionality. Um, these are two major techniques that we use all the time to do this uh, and those uh, libraries and frameworks I mentioned before uh, are what industry leaders use today to actually solve these problems and to do things like, uh, you know, speech recognition, uh, build self-driving cars, you name it. Um, so as I mentioned before, actually I didn't mention this before, um, so uh, essentially we were applying something called homotopy type theory in order to implement concepts from algebraic topology. Uh, essentially, you know, algebraic topology is what people use uh, in string theory, which is pretty hard and complicated. So programmers being lazy and chilled out, uh, we try to use homotopy types to make this thing a lot easier. Um, specifically, uh, we use things called a monad to try and describe the notion of closeness or openness. Um, a lot of you programmers are probably used, especially the front-end guys, React. Uh, that right there is a functional library, and you constantly use monads all the time. You've been using these tools without even knowing it. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we're using this to you know, make uh, these concepts in algebraic topology that we use to solve graph computation problems simpler. Um, the main component of this is something called a monad. Uh, a monad is essentially the concept of a box that can have either a thing or nothing inside of it. Uh, if we want to extend that to uh, a little bit further out, uh, we can turn that into something called a monoid, which can be a box that contain either a box or nothing. Uh, and with that structure itself, I can show very succinctly that every single blockchain, possibly without IOTA or the Tangle, it's a little weird, uh, can be described in terms of one fundamental structure, and that is a flat map over a monad. Every single blockchain is a flat map over a monad. Remember that. Uh, essentially, it's that simple, um, and we're going to show you how and why that matters. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about, too, and uh, this will sort of tie into uh, how we actually try to apply uh, notions in physical systems to make our distributed system, uh, you know, theoretically unbounded. Uh, let's take a look at something called a serverless architecture. So in 2007, when Bitcoin came out, uh, major tech companies were having a serious issue with something called a monolithic architecture. Uh, that's sort of the same problem we have right now when, uh, you know, the transaction rate for Bitcoin seven, uh, I think it's what, seven seconds per TX. It's basically uh, bounded, uh, it, it's this monolithic architecture. What does that mean? Um, there's no way that you can easily scale this actual system. Uh, so what they did was uh, they came up with this concept of horizontal scaling. How can I basically find a way to add more nodes to my network and thus make it go faster? How can I make my throughput linear within, uh, as a function of the number of nodes? Uh, and this is uh, exemplified right here in these Death Star diagrams. So sort of at the same time when Bitcoin came out, people were actually solving this problem. Um, now we're sort of taking those solutions and applying it to create an unbounded blockchain. As you can see right here in the Death Star diagram, uh, the lack of lines going through here is essentially uh, equivalent to more throughput. Um, so now we're going to get to how Constellation works. So as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we're applying this concept of, uh, you know, um, uh, so we're basically applying this concept of algebraic topology, right? And we want to, use, to implement it using homotopy types. Um, so we're going to get to where all this uh, you know, fits in in a second. But let's think about right now what actually is uh, you know, a blockchain. It's just a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you know, as same as you'd see in like Tor or BitTorrent. Um, and this network itself has a notion of something called a topology. I'm not going to get down into what that actually means, but uh, let's break down the actual structure that Brendan mentioned a second ago, a DAG, a direction, uh, the cyclicness, in our case, acyclic, and then a graph. That notion of a DAG itself has a topology, and that topology in itself 
can give us a topological space. Um, so right here, I want to just break down really quickly. One, the topological space is given by a sorting of our directed acyclic graph right here on the right. Uh, and in the bottom, when you take a look at these different nested spheres, um, you can sort of see this as essentially different layers inside of our ordering. Uh, as I'll get to in a second, that lower one, pi one, uh, that's something called a homotopy group, and that defines the outer uh, surface area, if you will, of our network. Our throughput is equivalent to the surface area of our outer homotopy group. Uh, so one thing I mentioned, Brenton also mentioned is that our notion of, uh, you know, how the decentralized internet will look uh, will be that applications use multiple different blockchains, uh, and the intermixing of those blockchains or protocols is something called a chain complex. Um, it's, uh, the irony is not lost on me that 50 years ago someone came up with this and called it a chain complex completely before any of this was ever created, but there you go. Uh, basically, this notion right here, uh, when you take a look uh, at an arrow in between one of those Cs, uh, that right there is consensus. Uh, one of those actual um, C or D can be thought of as a type of like a block or a transaction. Uh, the change of a memory pool, let's say one of those Cs to uh, let's say C plus K plus one to CK is the process of, you, of a blockchain taking transactions in a mempool and turning it into a block. If you wanted to create a uh, blockchain that has some notion of sharding, um, basically take a look at two arrows there. Uh, that's like a really simple, in the simplest case, like a sharded MySQL database. In our case, we wanted to create a dynamically partitioned network that basically keeps creating as many different partitions as it needs to, uh, and that is known as sort of like a, you know, C-smooth chain complex. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about, too, is that we need to describe some notion of liquidity in order to make sense of how do we take blocks from a lower tier in our homotopy group, a chain fiber, if you will, um, if anybody who's read the uh, Polkadot white paper, uh, how do we make sure that those blocks are equivalent to a transaction from the lowest state all the way to the global state? Well, we enforce some notion of homotopy equivalence. So as I was mentioning before, we're using this concept of homotopy in order to implement a really out there thing called algebraic topology. That actually just means type equivalence. Uh, as a programmer, is my integer equivalent to a string? That's how we're going to define liquidity between blockchains. That's how we define liquidity between our own protocol. So how do we, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we wanted to apply, uh, turn this thing into an optimization problem. Uh, and obviously, if you want to solve a problem, uh, the smartest thing you can do is just copy what nature did. So, a lot of people who, uh, you know, came before us realized that you could apply a fractal surface to solve the dark silicone prog program uh, in hardware engineering. What does that mean? It means that as things get really hot, when your computer gets really hot, it gets really slow. Uh, in order to make sure that that heat doesn't uh, affect your computer's performance or make it go slow, we can increase the surface area to mitigate that, you know, heat conduction. Uh, we applied the same thing to our network, and as you can see right here, the Mendra sponge was used to solve the dark silicon problem. We used a dendrogram. So quite literally, uh, you know, a fractal uh, uh, shape can just minimize the entropy in a system. So uh, going back to the Death Star diagram that I mentioned before, uh, that right there is our Death Star diagram throughout each different tier of our network. One block only goes from the lower tier directly to the top. No relay chains, um, you know, no, none of that stuff. There's no waiting for anything. You, go, you put your transaction into a lower tier, it bubbles all the way to the top, and from the perspective of the user, the transaction rate is literally bounded by how long it may, takes for consensus to be performed. In our case, a few seconds. So. One other thing I want to mention before, which I'm totally going to gloss over this, uh, but basically how do we ensure that, you know, um, we can ensure homotopy between those different tiers, as I mentioned before, those different homotopy groups all the way to the top of the global state? We use something called a recursion scheme. Uh, and when I, in my white paper, uh, you, I've mentioned something I call like hilo chain or like a hylomorphism, uh, and then there's also this duo, dual notion called a metamorphism. This allows us to gossip messages up our chain and down our chain while preserving homotopy. As I mentioned before, uh, we're using uh, sort of like a iterative self-similar structure in order to solve uh, or minimize entropy, sort of like the solving like a closest packing of spheres problem. Uh, we need to apply an application of calc a new type of calculus called fractional calculus in order to make sense in our oddly dimensional space. Uh, I'm not going to go into that right here, but I think it's great to just sort of exemplify the idea that between uh, you know one layer in a homotopy group and another one is one line in typical calculus. In ours, it's sort of this notion of multiple different 
uh, dots being connected by a plane. Uh, and specifically speaking, our actual network regulates itself autonomously uh, using a secondary protocol implemented via a metamorphism. Uh, same thing as a high-low, but going downwards. And in our case, that metamorphism implements something we've called entropic flow. Uh, basically, we apply in an application of something called Ricci flow, which is used a lot in sensors, uh, to basically minimize the flow of disorder within our network and sort of over time take a really oblong disordered shape like that A down there and turn it into something like a C. Uh, and it's sort of an extension of what BitTorrent's doing. So I want to talk about how this goes into the actual like internet of blockchains or sort of a way in which we can take this, uh, this framework that we've used in Constellation to create our scalability uh, and then create something akin to like an ERTC20 standard for blockchain protocols as, you know, we move forward. Uh, essentially, uh, there is this notion of something called a sheaf. Uh, who here's ever eaten oatmeal before? Anyone? Oatmeal in the morning, right? You guys notice how it's kind of flat and there's a little line in the center? It doesn't normally come like that. Uh, when it's sitting on an actual uh, stalk, it looks like a little, little berry. Uh, and the surface of that berry is called a sheaf. It's this hard little thing, and when you stamp it, you can remove it and get the good stuff on the inside, that flat bit called a germ. That notion is what we use in order to stitch together a space upon which we can do calculus, upon which we can do mathematics. Uh, that space is called a manifold, and we need that in order to rigorously and formally verify and define what are we actually doing when we're trying to solve a problem. Uh, what does that mean? When people talk about, have you formally uh, verified or like defined your blockchain? This is what we do when we solve all different types of problems in math. Um, that's what it's called in blockchain is formal verification. Uh, so essentially, this notion of a sheaf uh, is a way in which we can sort of stitch together different dimensional spaces. Uh, as a matter of fact, a sheaf is sort of like, uh, if you've ever heard of the uh, paradox of like the particle on the wave, um, the sheaf is actually the particle that describes the topology of that manifold that the wave lives upon. And we can stitch together these different sheaves using something called a tensor product. Right there in the bottom of that little Y, it should actually look like a plus sign, but close enough. So if I want to actually talk about uh, or describe what does that mean, uh, a great example I could use uh, would be that of shearing or a stress tensor. Uh, so when people build skyscrapers, you need to make sure that you have a really powerful scaffolding, right, in order to make sure that you can withstand something like an earthquake or like a blockchain, like a DDoS attack. Uh, essentially, in our case, we use something called uh, a tensor product in order to encapsulate the notion of force coming in at an oblong dimension uh, and acting on multiple different orthogonal dimensions at the same time. So if you've ever seen sort of like, uh, you know, the ground go like this during an earthquake and you see how we use tensors in order to understand how that's actually going to create sort of a push and pull within a material itself. Um, so if one can sort of encapsulate that, that right there uh, is sort of the space upon which entropic flow exists. Um, we built our own resilient autonomous network in the same way we build resilient, uh, well, not necessarily autonomous uh, buildings. Um, so one thing I also want to talk about, and I'll gloss over this as well, is that uh, the decentralized internet, using the framework we've talked about, is essentially something we call in physics a gauge field. Um, I won't get too into it, but essentially, um, one can think about the ambient spaces on all of your devices, the wasted RAM, the clock cycles that aren't being used as potential energy that is just waiting to be tapped. We have a framework that exists right now that's been around for at least 50 years in physics that we use in order to engineer materials. Um, and it allows us to essentially uh, have a mathematical framework in addition to a typological or homotopy type framework, a way in which we can program these things um, so that people who are you know, math heavy can sort of get into this whole space and find a way to extract value um, in the same sense that uh, I, I believe Ocean mentioned of there being sort of like a um, network of topological data being available through marketplaces. So one thing I want to mention too is that the decentralized internet will be composed of facts. Uh, every single blockchain uh, contains data with some notion of a probability associated to it. Um, sort of the idea with, uh, you know, what's happened with Cambridge Analytica, uh, you know, one can say, hey, maybe this, this could possibly be a solution to, you know, fake news out there. I don't really know. But I know that IoT devices and sensors and robots and self-driving cars all need it. Maybe we do too. Um, and it's sort of our, our conjecture that this autonomous data infrastructure of essentially removing, uh, you know, wasted heat from our, from our economy um, could be an easy way that we implement a global social safety net. 
Um, one other thing I want to mention too is that notion that I talked about before of applying this framework uh, to describe or to uh, implement and uh, model blockchains themselves will be something akin to an ERC-20 framework. Uh, it, it works both on paper and it works both uh, on the computer with your compiler. Um, decentralization is no longer a myth and I think it's as simple as a compiler plugin. Um, so one other thing I want to mention too, just sort of tying it back into my little anecdote about you want to copy nature. Uh, a bunch of people in a field called complex systems theory are trying to apply this type of secondary calculus, is what it's called, um, to describe uh, you know, physical or you know, um, social systems. Um, Cities themselves can be thought of as a manifold where each bit of infrastructure, whether it's the piping, whether it's the electricity, whether it's the transportation, each one of them is a sheaf. Uh, and that sheaf is given by a blockchain um, where like that blockchain could be the infrastructure upon which you know, people drive their cars, they do something else, blah, blah, blah. But in this sense, you can think of a city being a chain complex with each sheaf made up of different parts of the infrastructure. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just sort of wrap up to say, if that got a little bit deeper at times, it's just sort of us demonstrating that we have a very, very unique and novel way of approaching this problem of scalability. And scalability isn't going to be solved by side chains or synchronous nodes. It's going to be solved by connecting every device in the world and bringing this mesh net of interconnectivity together, making sure that every single person on this planet can interact with one else and transact value and receive value back for things they're not using. And that's what our kind of goal is, is to bring that about and make sure that everyone can communicate in a very, very interconnected, interconnected global way. And that's it.